Right. Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the HoloTube seminar. We are very happy to have Jan de Boer from Amsterdam, and he is going to tell us about quantum gravity and statistical physics, as you can read from the slide. But Jan can tell us more about this. The stage is yours. Cool. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot for the um, invitation. Uh, it's always nice to uh, see some people and uh, <laughs> over Zoom. Um, today, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, some work I've been doing for the last, uh, well, basically two years, I guess, uh, together with Alex Bellin, uh, my PhD student Diego Liska, and also with Pranjal Nayak, uh, a postdoc at Geneva, Julian Sommer, and uh, Tarek Anous, who's a postdoc in Amsterdam. Um, so we've been trying to develop some sort of uh, picture of what semi-classical gravity is describing. And uh, the, the main upshot of the talk is to try to give you some evidence that semi-classical gravity is in some sense a statistical theory. It contains statistical information about the full theory, uh, which is a bit different from how normal semi-classical or low energy effective field theory works. So it's uh, basically um, trying to promote the idea that, that, that semi-classical gravity is a very peculiar theory and it has very close connections and interesting connections to statistical physics. <clears throat> um, this is, this, you know, if you want, this picture is closely related to a lot of recent work that has been done, in particular on uh, the SYK model, uh, JT gravity, uh, uh, connections with matrix models and so on. Uh, but the, the proposal here is that uh, there is a very general picture. We don't yet know exactly what a general picture is, but there's a lot of evidence that semi-classical gravity is in some sense uh, some version of statistical physics. Um, so as I said, we normally uh, think of semi-classical gravity as some just some plain vanilla low energy effective field theory. And if Semi-classical gravity were just like all other non-gravitational low energy effective field theories, then it you know, would be some very useful, nice theory, and it would have no access to or have information about energies above the UV cutoff of the theory. Uh, but semi-classical gravity is, is a very different low energy effective field theory as opposed to uh, other non-gravitational cousins, uh, because Semi-classical gravity, although it is just a low energy effective field theory at first sight, it has some interesting information in it, which ordinary low energy effective field theories do not. Uh, and that makes it a really interesting and different theory. Uh, so in particular, uh, this, this low energy effective field theory knows about the high temperature partition function of the theory. And that is because, uh, so most of the things I say are based on uh, thinking about ADS-CFT and holography, obviously, it's holotube after all. Uh, it's mostly based on uh, ADS-CFT intuition, um, although some of the principles might be more broadly applicable. Um, but one thing that, for example, semi-classical gravity knows about is about uh, the high temperature partition function of the theory, because you can just make a black hole, you can make the black hole as hot as you want, you can use semi-classical methods to compute this entropy. You don't need to do any quantum nothing. You can use just a saddle point computation in gravity. And what you get is uh, the high temperature partition function of the dual CFT uh, for any temperature. So you know something just, just based only using low energy effective field theory, you know uh, basically the density of states at high energies by just computing the partition function uh, of a black hole. More generally, in ADS-CFT, for example, you can put the boundary field theory on some arbitrary Euclidean manifold, find a corresponding semi-classical bulk solution that has that boundary and compute the partition function of the field theory on some Euclidean manifold. You can also compute correlators on that manifold. And that is not something that you can do in ordinary low energy effective field theory because you don't have uh, you know, the gravitational uh, freedom in it. Um, Low energy effective field theory also knows about the page curve. This is like a fairly famous development of the last few years. You can uh, get the page curve out using only semi-classical gravitational methods. 
it's a bit of a delicate question whether this is really an observation that is purely within semi-classical gravity or whether it uses other ingredients. And in all honesty, it does use other ingredients because to really get the page curve out, you need to couple your gravitational system to an external non-gravitational system. And you need to imagine that you have infinite control over this non-gravitational system. Um, but if you do that, then uh, you can uh, do a semi-classical gravitational computation and uh, get the page curve out that tells you that uh, black hole creation and evaporation is a, a unitary process. But I'm not going to talk about that uh, particular famous uh, example anymore. Uh, another thing you can get, it appears from semi-classical gravity, is so-called spectral correlations. Um, so spectral correlations refer to uh, things like uh, the two-point correlation function of the spectral density between energies E and E prime. Um, that is something that is apparently computable using uh, semi-classical gravitational methods. Uh, and in particular, you seem to uh, be able to have access to some UV information like eigenvalue repulsion by computing spectral correlations. Um, what is a, a new ingredient, both for spectral correlations um, and for other things, is that you need so-called uh, wormhole solutions that have more than one asymptotic boundary. So to compute these spectral correlations, you need uh, like a solution with two boundaries, where one spectral density is so, sort of coming from one boundary and the other one from the other boundary. And to have these correlations, you need to connect the geometry. Because if you have a disconnected geometry, there would not be a connected two-point function. It would just reduce to the product of two one-point functions. Um, and the existence of these wormhole-type topologies in um, generic semi-classical gravitational theories also lead to a so-called puzzle. Namely, it leads to an apparent lack of factorization. These wormhole solutions, like, like this one here, um, it looks like um, if these wormhole solutions are really there, it looks like the gravitational theory cannot be dual to a single CFT. That's what it looks like. Because this wormhole configuration would, would give rise to a connected two-point function of two partition functions, connected. Uh, and if you just have a single field theory, there is no such connected two-point function. And if you have just a single CFT and you compute this partition function and you compute the product of two partition functions, it's just the product of the two numbers. There's no connected, nothing going on. Um, and a standard way in which you can get such connected correlation functions between partition functions is if those partition functions include some amount of disorder. Um, because then what you really are doing is that these partition functions depend on a disorder parameter. Uh, and then you can get these correlations going. However, we do believe that in ADS CFT, at least there's no reason to believe otherwise, that uh, in many examples of ADS CFT, the gravitational theory is really dual to a single well-defined conformal field theory and not dual to an average of theories. So there's a bit of a puzzle. For example, uh, in the famous ADS-5 case, we think it's dual to just a single instance of n equals four super angles theory and not to some ensemble of n equals four super angles theories. Um, so these are all interesting features of semi-classical gravity that have been observed over time. Now it's important, uh, by the way, please interrupt anytime uh, if you have a question or want to make a comment, because it would be nice to not just be talking by myself. Or the, so. um, now, none of these computations um, really give you exact UV information. The only thing you get from any of these things that are mentioned here is a version of coarse grained UV information. It's always averaged of some sort or another. Um, that's logical because it would be very strange if we could use only semi-classical methods to compute some UV quantity up to arbitrary precision. Presumably for that, we need the full UV theory and not just a low energy semi-classical description. This notion of coarse graining is perhaps better 
if we just think about uh, the spectral density. Um, because, for example, if you do the first item that I mentioned, namely suppose that we uh, compute the entropy of a black hole semi-classically, then from that you get an approximate expression for the partition function of the theory as a function of the inverse temperature. And from that you can extract the density of states. However, the density of states that stands here that you extract from the black hole computation is not the exact density of states that the theory is, should have, which is a sum of delta functions. Rather, what you get if you do this computation and you uh, compute a partition function of a black hole, you do an inverse Laplace transform in order to extract the spectral density, what you get is a smooth function of the energy and not a sum of delta functions. If one really wanted to get the sum of delta functions, one would need to have an exponential accuracy in computing the black hole entropy. Uh, and that's not the type of accuracy that uh, is available to you if you're just doing semi-classical gravity. So although we get some high energy information from computing the entropy of a black hole, we don't get exact UV information. We get some smeared version, a coarse grain of the UV information of the theory. We get some sort of coarse grained version of the sum of delta functions. Now, if it would of course be great if we would see the sum over delta functions because then we would purely in semi-classical gravity, we would be able to see all the microstates of the black hole purely in the semi-classical description. Uh, well, you know, there might be people that think that that is a possibility, but it's certainly not typically what happens in any semi-classical description. There might be some exceptions. This might be true, now, like integrable theories, topological theories, maybe BPS black holes, but for a generic non-supersymmetric situation, I don't think we expect to be able to see all these individual EIs and all the microstates uh, directly in the semi-classical theory. In particular, all those energies, EI, they have uh, an energy spacing, which is of the order of E to the minus S. Uh, so you would need to really resolve things with a precision E minus S in the semi-classical theory to see all these individual energy eigenvalues, and that seems very unlikely. Presumably, this is not part of the validity of uh, low energy effective field theory. Now you can, can ask a question, Jan. Yeah, sure. Um, hi. So, well, but there, there was this paper by, uh, you know, long time ago, such Dev, um, Denev, and Hartnell, where they were mapping, you know, like they were considering some um, scalar field in the bulk and the fluctuations of the scalar field. There was, you can express essentially the quasi normal modes of the black hole in terms of those, uh, you know, one over n square corrections, that is determinant corrections. So, that was, so I was wondering if you can, if you add somehow, Suppose that you have infinite power and you can compute all the the um, the quasi normal modes of a black hole, and add those corrections on the on the left hand side of your equation to when you compute the the entropy. So they would be essentially the, this determinant corrections. Would you expect in that case to get um, enough accuracy to, to resolve the the density of states? I wouldn't would not think so because I think. Um... I think at best what you get from that is uh, power law corrections and not exponential corrections. So, okay. Because roughly, in, in some sense, you could say that, that um, what, for example, in the simple three dimensional case, I think what uh, one way to see what they is computing is that. Uh, uh, they, I think they end up, roughly speaking, with the modular transform of the vacuum virusoral block. Uh, because mm -hmm. you put all these quasi-normal modes and then you put them together into some determinant formula. Uh, and that looks exactly like a virusoral character, if I remember correctly that paper. Uh, mm -hmm. So what you seem to be getting is the modular transform of the, of the vacuum block. But the modular transform of the vacuum block uh, is some modification of the Cardi formula. It has some extra wiggles on it. It has some substructure, but it's still a smooth function of the energy. I see. I see. So you, yeah, so, so you just deformed the classical theory in some sense. Okay. Yeah, in some sense, I think it's a bit like including. Uh, it's like adding a coherent state to the to the in the bulk or something. Like including one over s corrections to the theory rather than the e minus s that you need in order to. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks.
Now you can ask questions about um, connected correlators like uh, the spectral correlation functions that I mentioned or the product of two partition functions uh, that vanish in a single microscopic theory. But because of the existence of wormholes, it looks like semi-classical gravity might yield a non-zero answer. Now you can ask a question, how can semi-classical gravity yield a non-zero answer for something whose precise answer is zero? Uh, how can that be compatible if you don't introduce averaging or something like that? And the answer to that question has to do with the fact that, that semi-classical gravity is a statistical theory. Uh, so to just give you a cartoon um, expression, um, for, for how this might work. This is not literally a partition function, but suppose that you take a huge number of random faces. You, you take random faces, one particular set of random faces, e to the phi i. And you look at, and as our partition function, we take, say, the sum of all those uh, faces, e to the i phi i. Well, clearly, this sum of phases will be essentially zero because all these phases will kill each other out. And as a semi-classical observer, you won't be able to really see directly that the sum of the phases is non-zero. You will just see that it's essentially zero. If, however, you take the product of a sum of phases and this complex conjugate, so this is a bit like trying to compute this two-point function, then on the right-hand side, there are two interesting terms. One is the diagonal piece, and one is the off-diagonal piece. And roughly the idea of this, why, you know, the rough idea of interpreting semi-classical gravity as a statistical theory is that this diagonal piece is large. It, it is sort of uh, showing constructive interference, if you want. It's a term of order n, and this would be the term that would be visible in the gravitational theory, whereas all these other erratic phases that averaged, if you do any coarse graining of those phases, they would just sort of roughly average to zero they would be invisible in gravity. So, so this cartoon situation would be a situation where the one point function of Z would appear to be zero, whereas approximately zero is the two point function would be approximately N. Obviously in the full microscopic theory, um, the one point function is not exactly zero, but it's some very small number. And the two point function is the product of those two very small numbers. However, a gravitational theory is unable to resolve these small fluctuating random numbers. Uh, it's just not part of the semi-classical theory. The semi-classical theory is a suitable coarse graining. Therefore, if the UV theory had this particular structure, so if the UV theory consisted of a huge number of random faces, then the prediction for semi-classical gravity would be that the one-point function of Z would be zero and the two-point function would be N. So, what you're getting here is statistical information about these random phases rather than the individual random phases, because this is simply telling us that the expectation value of all these random phases is zero. And this tells us that the variance of all those random phases is square root n. Uh, so what you're probing here, and this is just a cartoon to give you the main idea. What you're probing with semi-classical computations is statistical properties of a large number of erratic numbers that describe the UV theory. So the low energy effective field theory, semi-classical gravity, is sensitive. You can use it to diagnose the average size of fluctuations, but you can never get like the individual fluctuations themselves. That is what semi-classical gravity is doing, and that explains between quotation marks, why you can have wormholes without having actual averaging going on in the UV. The wormholes are just a manifestation of the fact that you know something about the average fluctuations in the system, but that you cannot detect the individual numbers. Um, well, let me skip this one, it's not so important. Uh, so, so the, the picture is that semi-classical gravity, as far as semi-classical computations are concerned, you might as well replace the UV sector of the theory by a 
random distribution of things by a probability distribution, and it would give exactly the same low energy physics. So here is a cartoon of uh, sort of what happens to the degrees of freedom in a typical strongly coupled theory. Uh, so if you start with like a um, like on this side with like a weakly coupled theory, it has some nice discrete energy spectrum. And as we all uh, know and believe, if you crank up the coupling, so you go to a strongly coupled CFT that has a weakly coupled gravitational dual theory, the spectrum roughly splits at strong coupling and large N into this low energy sector where we believe the theory is integral. And this is the sector where sort of the conformal dimensions of operators or the energies uh, don't scale with N. And then there is this incredibly dense high energy sector of the theory. This is where the black holes live. This is where the theory is believed to be chaotic. Uh, and this is roughly the sort of picture of a strongly coupled CFT. Uh, and the semi-classical gravitational theory lives down here. It can probe statistical features of this part of the theory, but it cannot resolve these individual lines. That is basically the picture. But, uh, but can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. How is this different from conventional quantum field theory? Where is the gravity part sit in? I think in a conventional quantum field theory, you uh, would never have this wormhole phenomenon. So you'd never be able to compute a fluctuation like that using a semi-classical method. Uh, if, that, that, that I would agree with, but in, in this particular picture, Oh, no, this could be applicable to any, uh, there's no gravity here at all. Yes. And okay. this could be true. It, it is just, I think that um, that this sector, we can still have access to this sector with semi-classical gravitational solutions. And that is if we only had standard low energy effect field theory on the boundary, just in field theory without, gra without the semi-classical gravitational. Uh, I don't think you can compute in a standard low energy effect of field theory, the high temperature partition function of the theory. But if you have uh, a if I, 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 I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but if I if I if I'm allowed to have solitonic objects in a standard quantum field theory. And I considered, I mean, we usually think of quantum field theory around the vacuum, we do perturbation theory, and all this UV stuff is cut off by an RG flow and protected by energy scaling. But the analog of a black hole is a, is a fat soliton. Right, and and no, sorry, the, in the field theory. No, I would say suppose I in the standard model you want to compute the density of states of the theory well above the Planck scale. If the standard model were just a field theory, right, we, you would know what it is because you don't know what degrees of freedom you have to integrate in above the cutoff. You would know how to do it. Um, no, I, 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 I don't, I don't have a good analogy. My, my close analogy would be electroweak theory, and you, you try to integrate the RG flow, and you hit a Landau pole. And I don't know if that tells me anything about the spectrum at the UV. No, but I, I mean, I, know I, that I there, think there is more stuff. A better analogy would be QCD, I think, because in QCD you don't have to, you, you know, in principle. Yeah, but entire... QCD. The QCD, the RG flow goes the wrong way. Right, exactly. That's that's what I'm so the, oh. the high high energy phase would be some something like a plasma. If you listen, if you if you know what the UV, uh, if you happen to know what the UV completion is and you happen to know there's a UV fixed point, you might be able to do something. But if you're in a theory and you don't know what the UV completion is, uh, and you it's unknown whether additional degrees of freedom uh, enter above the UV cutoff then you will be hard pressed to get give me a reasonable estimate for the partition function of the theory at very high temperature. Because you don't even know what the fundamental degrees of freedom at high temperatures are because you integrate those out when you went into the low energy effective field theory. However, okay, I don't, don't want to dis distract you further from your story, but uh, thanks. Um, but yeah, but that's the main point. Whereas if you, if you have a weakly coupled gravitational dual, you can use the gravitational dual uh, which remains semi-classical, even if you capture the high temperature physics of the dual field theory. 
So the field theory becomes very, uh, is described by very non-semi-classical stuff, but the dual gravitational theory remains semi-classical even at high temperature. And that's why you have more than you could do uh, in a non-gravitational theory. That, that's, so gravity, so this picture has nothing to do with gravity whatsoever, a priori. However, the fact that we have a semi-classical gravitational dual allows us to get access to the sector of the theory, which might not be available otherwise. Can I also ask one question? Um, um, so how do you square this picture with n equals to four super young males? I mean, there in the large n limit at zero temperature, you would expect the whole thing to be integrable. And then you have to put in temperature for it to be chaotic and to have some dual to a black hole. But that temperature scale is usually not associated with high energy physics, it's low energy physics. So I, I'm very confused how, how, how you square this picture with, you know, with n equals to four super young, young males, what we know there about integrability, not integrability at finite temperature, things like this. Yeah, so in the large n limit, uh, n equals four super young males theory is not an integrable theory. Even at zero temperature? Yeah. Is this known? I think it's known that at large, so planar n equals four super young mills theory is an integrable theory, uh, but non planar n equals four super young mills theory is not believed to be an integrable theory. Otherwise, you could compute uh, this. I think this part of the spectrum. So if if you um, is is presumably highly non universal, this high energy part of the spectrum. So these are energies that scale like n squared. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so they don't behave, there's no uniform large end limit in this sector. There simply is no uniform large end limit. For each end, this is a very weird set of numbers. And if you make n one large, it becomes a different set of difficult numbers. There's no systematic way to treat this sector in one over n perturbation theory or whatever. It just cannot be done. Here, these dimensions, they are all the, the you know the conformal dimensions or energies here. They're fixed, and then they uh, have one of n corrections and so on. And uh, they have good large n limits. So this sector of the theory is controllable in the large n limit, and it's integral. Uh, this sector doesn't have a good large n limit, and it's not integral. It's okay, not yeah, that that makes sense. So what, what what what? How does all this change when you add finite temperature then? It doesn't, no, finite, this is just the spectrum of the theory, so there's no temperature here. Mm -hmm. If you, if you, if you uh, compute the finite temperature partition function, then at low temperatures, you're dominated by these guys here, and you can compute it very precisely. And at high temperatures, that partition function will get contributions from these things. Um, and it will always involve a large number of these degrees of freedom. It, because you compute a partition function, you smear over a certain region of energies. That's why you never see the individual energies, but you always see like a smeared version of the spectrum. Okay, okay, thanks. That is what black holes, uh, black holes don't give you this, uh, like this sum of delta functions, uh, where was it here? It's not something you get from a black hole computation. You get a smeared version of it. Does that answer the question or? Uh, I, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's clearer. Um, I, yeah, I have to think about it. But, but thank you for the explanation. Okay, cool, thanks for the questions. Um, so now comes the main claim, and I'll try to give some evidence for it. So the main claim is that, that semi-classical gravity ultimately is the theory of the statistics of the chaotic sector of the theory. Um, so it can probe all kinds of higher moments of the relevant statistical distributions, but not individual values. Uh, and in fact, it cannot distinguish average from non-average theories, as long as the averages yield the same moments of the probability distributions as the non-average theory. Uh, and perhaps there is some fundamental limitation all in all here on how much information you can actually obtain as a low energy observer. So suppose, for example, um, again, I emphasize is that all, everything I'm saying has nothing to do with averaging per se. It applies to a single theory. 
You could, for example, imagine that the chaotic sector of the theory, the high energy sector, that somehow the energy spectrum is a bit like the digits of pi. That's a very specific series of numbers. But if you do any coarse grained measurement of large numbers of digits of pi, you will never be able to figure out that these were not drawn from a random probability distribution. Because the numbers in pi, uh, that's a math theorem, the numbers in pi are uniformly randomly distributed over zero through nine, each with probability 0 0.1. And as far as I know, there's no known higher order non-trivial correlation in the digits of pi. Like if you ask what's the correlation between uh, the nth digit and the n plus seventh digit, it's zero. They're really almost like independently drawn from a, a uniform probability distribution between zero and nine. And if you say, ask what is the average value of digits uh, 1 million up to 2 million of pi, it's just going to be four and a half with an incredibly small error. And um, so, and that's the low energy computation, which simply gives you say uh, four and a half. And you would not be able to tell that uh, there was some actual specific set of numbers rather than just the probability distribution. So what you can compute if you study decimals of pi is you can see that the average digit is four and a half. You can see that uh, the variance of a digit is, uh, what is it, a square root of eight and a quarter or whatever. You can see all these things, but you can never resolve these individual values if all that you do is make measurements of humongously large numbers of digits at the same time. Um, now, let me first give you some evidence for this picture using operator statistics. Um, so in any conformal field theory, we have so the so-called OPE coefficients. It's basically uh, the three-point function of three operators, one inserted at infinity, one at one, and one at zero. And I'm going to use labels L and H to denote so-called light and heavy operators. And uh, that refers to this picture of the spectrum, where here, these are the heavy operators, and here, these are the light operators. And the light operators are part, if you wish, of your semi-classical description, and the heavy operators are not. Um, then the uh, incarnation of what I was saying before is that semi-classical gravitational theories has access to the statistics of these OPE coefficients, coarse grained over these heavy indices, but not to their individual values. So say this one here, if you plot this one as a function of h, it will be some very erratic set of numbers. And, and using a gravitational description, you could sort of uh, compute maybe the average of this set of numbers, and maybe you can compute the average variance around this line, but you will never see the individual values. That would be the version of the statement. That doesn't mean that these individual values don't exist. You just simply have no access to them. To be a bit more precise, uh, we propose something called this, the OPE randomness hypothesis, which says that each of these OPE coefficients, that is a mix of low and high energy information, is given by a slowly varying function f that depends on the energies of the heavy um, operators that appear in the OPE. Um, times an R, which is some sort of random type object. It is going to have uh, a mean equal to zero. We can assume it has a variance equal to one. So that means that this, the one point function sorry, of R uh, is zero. The two point function is approximately one. And then there can be higher order correlation functions, which are like the higher moments of the probability distributions. They will be exponentially suppressed, but they are in principle computable, but the individual values are not. And um, in some sense, this is an extension of what is called the eigenstate normalization hypothesis um, of, uh, say, condensed matter physics, because a particular case is, in, if you wish, is the so called eigenstate normalization hypothesis which is very much in the same spirit. In the eigenstate normalization hypothesis, we connect the uh, 
expectation value of a light operator, a simple operator O, between two very high energy states, EI and EJ, in the chaotic theory. And the claim is that for all practical purposes, this can be replaced by something which is uh, diagonal times a smoothly varying function plus something that's erratic, has an exponential prefactor, uh, and has some random matrix R here. Um, and since uh, these energies are high, this is very much like a high, low, high correlator. So it's literally computing uh, ETH is really making a statement in the CFT about the light, heavy, heavy OPE coefficient. Um, so ETH is a well-known hypothesis and it has exactly the same flavor because when the eigenstate normalization hypothesis was proposed, no one said that these are, are really random variables. It, the only statement was that as far as low energy computations go, you can assume this form of the correlator and you produce the right low energy physics. So as far as low energy physics goes, you might as well assume that these are some random numbers because you always coarse grain in any low energy computation. And that coarse graining is the same whether or not the R's were actual random numbers or whether they were a very specific drawing from some probability distribution. Um, this has not been proven. It seems very difficult to prove. Maybe it's not even possible to prove it. Um, so a feature of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, for example, is it correctly reproduces the thermal one and two point functions. It also implies that typical states look thermal. And all this information is in agreement with and available to a, you know, a semi-classical theory of gravity. In particular, um, it is in agreement with low energy physics, if you want, or with the sort of things that uh, semi-classical gravity has access to. It, it does not disagree. It, it's one way. If you want, ETH is just a way to repackage low energy information in, uh, in a suitable way. And none of this proves that ETH is valid, um, nor does it, uh, and ETH really require more input than simply the finite temperature one and two point functions of the theory. So there's no actual new prediction here, if you wish. Uh, it is just a way to reinterpret your low energy information in a statistical way. Um, and this you could do in any theory. You can even write down ETH in an integrable theory, and you would still not find any obvious disagreement with uh, the thermal one and two point functions. What you would find disagreement with is the observation that all typical states look thermal. That is certainly not true in an integrable theory, and that probably requires a chaotic theory. So how do you test these types of ideas? How do you come and um, how can you find evidence for these types of theories? Well, one important uh, tool to test some of these ideas is so-called crossing symmetry in the conformal field theory. And crossing symmetry is the statement that uh, one particular, um, we should have written a sum L, is that simply this equation here, namely, um, if you have a four point function, you can factor it in two different channels. And the answer should be the same because there's only one four point function. Now, in this particular case, uh, this is very often dominated by the identity operator running here. Uh, and this has a very simple ex expression. And that must be reproduced by this sum over high uh, energy operators in the dual channel. Otherwise, crossing symmetry would be violated. Um, and simply by demanding that the leading singularity on this side is correctly reproduced by the sum over heavy states in the dual channel gives you statistical information uh, on these OPE coefficients that sit at these vertices. So there's a CLLH here and another CLLH here. Uh, and you find that CLLH squared must grow in a particular way with H in order to correctly reproduce the leading singularity you get on the left-hand side. 
So you can go in crossing symmetry, you can go to a particular kinematical regime where on the left-hand side, there is a singularity that you can control. And on the right-hand side, you must be able to re, uh, re-obtain the same singularity. And that from that, you can extract statistics of these open e-coefficients that must hold or have coarse grained values, if you wish. Um, then in two dimensions, there are some other techniques that you can use, which uh, use very specific two-dimensional uh, techniques using the so-called fusion kernel and modular kernel. Uh, these are very powerful techniques because although we do not know the explicit form of the most general conformal block in two dimensions, we do know the linear relation between those unknown conformal blocks if you uh, factorize four-point functions in two different channels. Um, so we do know the how to express this particular object into a sum of these particular objects, even though the individual conformal blocks are not known, we know the linear basis transformation that relates the two. And a similar statement applies to uh, sort of torus one-point functions and the modular kernel. Now it's a bit technical to explain this in more detail, so let me not do that and just give you some results. Um, so by looking at endpoint functions of light operators at finite temperature, which have this kind of diagrammatic, uh, oops, sorry, which have this kind of diagrammatic representation uh, in terms of OPE coefficients, one finds that the, so these brackets here indicate that a certain coarse graining is taking place. I could also have written an overline. That means that if you take the cave power of a light heavy heavy OPE coefficient and you do a suitable coarse graining of the heavy indices that it will scale like this quantity here, e to the minus k minus one times s, which was in fact a result written down by Foyni and Kuchan in uh, 2019. Um, and you see that higher or the higher powers of these OPE coefficients are exponentially suppressed in the entropy compared to lower powers. So there's some exponential hierarchy. But one does see that these things have uh, higher moments. They're exponentially suppressed, but you, it's exactly like a probability distribution. You can compute a one-point function, a two-point function, and higher point functions. Um, and they have some nice exponential hierarchy. There's a lot of other coefficients here that I'm suppressing that one can, in principle, compute. Um, we also looked at this diagram in two dimensions and found this particular funny hierarchy between the heavy, heavy, heavy OPE coefficients. So this is relevant for uh, partition functions on higher genus manifolds in two dimensions. But it does confirm this exponential hierarchy. Here's another thing, another diagram with a different topology, which gives a also an exponential hierarchy for OPE coefficients. Um, but it's a different uh, index contraction. Uh, we also studied this funny diagram here, um, which is a six-point function and uh, extracted from that all kinds of correlators, higher moments of different OPE coefficients in different combinations, and found these particular suppression factors with the entropy. Um, so this is a lot of technical work that uses all these different techniques. Um, and the main upshot is that in all cases, we find statistical looking answers for OPE coefficients that uh, seem to suggest that OPE coefficients for as far as semi-classical observations go can be thought of as being drawn from a probability distribution with certain moments that are computable. So what's the best way to say this? So if you do a low energy, sorry, if you do a low energy computation, that involves some a sum over actual OPE coefficients. These are the actual coefficients. It's the same as if you had to taken all these OPE coefficients from a probability distribution. 
plus exponentially small corrections. So the, the statement is that semi-classical computations that involve sums over OPE coefficients over the, and, and these are the actual OPE coefficients that all those computations are indistinguishable from an equivalent computation where we don't sum over the actual coefficients, but we sum over the coefficients drawn from a random probability distribution with moments that we can compute. So you cannot distinguish these precise numbers from these probabilistic quantities. And this would be the precise answer in an average theory, but we're not averaging. We're just observing that the low energy computations agree with statistical computations to very good accuracy. And therefore, low energy observers cannot distinguish uh, these sort of statistical theories from uh, microscopic single theories. Now, these results use general CFT techniques. So they apply in any CFT, not necessarily a chaotic CFT. Uh, but the size of the window of which you need to coarse grain clearly depends crucially on the theory. Um, and, and the same overall structure, a very qualitative structure, can also be obtained in uh, several other ways that I, I will describe now. So all these results suggest that, that in some sense, these OPE coefficients, uh, they are sort of taken from some sort of probability distribution. And uh, it's almost like you can do Feynman diagrams with them, because they are like random variables. And random variables. You know, you can uh, comp compute two-point functions, three-point functions, and so on. Um, and from given all your low energy information, you can reverse engineer this generating functional Z, order by order, such that it reproduces all these correlation functions of OPE coefficients. Uh, and these quadratic pieces are like the random Gaussian piece. And then these higher moments represent higher order moments of the relevant probability distributions. So all the computations that we did confirm that this picture is a correct way to capture all the low energy physics of that is captured uh, that you can uh, extract about open E coefficients. Now it's important to notice that this OPE randomness hypothesis has not been proven. Uh, and just like ETH is presumably only valid in a chaotic theory, um, I think this OPE randomness hypothesis will only be valid in a chaotic theory. Um, and I don't think we have really proven to begin with that strongly coupled CFTs with weakly coupled gravitational theories are, are chaotic. There's no real proof. There's strong indications they are like the bound on chaos of uh, Maldus energy and Stanford. Um, but there's no real proof. But one can test this consistency of this picture by various gravitational computations. So for example, uh, just ETH, for example, has a very specific prediction, namely that typical states are very exponentially, are exponentially difficult to distinguish from a thermal state. Although ETH does not contain more information than the thermal one and two point functions, which you could also write down in an integrable theory. It does make a particular prediction because of the structure that is written down. And that is the typical states are exponentially difficult to distinguish from a thermal state. And that agrees with what we know from gravitational computations. Namely, as far as we know, all typical states in the CFT look like a black hole for low energy observers. Um, otherwise, we would be able to distinguish all the individual microstates, and uh, that does not seem to be the case. So, th so there is a, some agreement between gravitational observations and uh, what is being stated by ETH, or more generally, this OPE randomness hypothesis. Now, interestingly, if you buy this hypothesis, and we have you can try to test it, and uh, in particular, it makes interesting predictions for wormholes. Because we give, I, I wrote down uh, correlation functions for these OPE coefficients, and now you can play the following game. For example, suppose you take the square in two dimensions, the square of the genus two partition function. 
the genus to partition function is given by this particular combination of OPE coefficients, where everything is assumed to be heavy. Uh, and it's easy to see that this is just basically uh, as a little diagram, it looks something like this. And if you fatten these tubes, the, the vertices, or sorry, the propagators a little bit, it looks like a genus two diagram. So this is uh, the product of two independent. This is a completely independent sum from this one. This is the product of two genus two partition functions. Now, if I am using my results for this generating functional, it is just like doing Feynman diagrams for these open E coefficients. Uh, so to leading order, I, you know, in order to do this computation, I should just write down wick contractions, which are given by these blue lines here. Well, there are two types of obvious wick contractions here. You can contract the C's within each sum, and that corresponds to a disconnected computation. And there is a corresponding uh, gravitational computation, which is drawn here, just as the product uh, of two ADS3 solutions whose boundary is a genus two surface. Uh, but there's also the other way contraction, which is described by a uh, genus two wormhole, at least that's the obvious candidate. Because now these way contractions connect these two different sums together. So if this statistical picture is correct, this wick contraction will be there, and the prediction is that therefore this wormhole should exist. So this is almost like uh, turning the logic around. We use the statistical picture to, to predict wormholes, rather than that we are using the wormholes to predict statistics. In this case, this wormhole does exist. It's well known. It's a very simple one. It was uh, written down by Maldesena and Maus already almost 20 years ago. Uh, and you can check explicitly that the partition function that you compute using uh, gravity uh, agrees approximately with what you get from these big contractions here. So that's evidence for that the statistical picture is correct and that these wormholes are simply a gravitational manifestation of the statistical nature of the OPE coefficients. Uh, well, this one was already known, but there's also two like interesting predictions that you can make. Um, one is if you take uh, the product of two genus two partition functions in a different corner of moduli space, that's some technical steps, but basically uh, instead of taking this topology where you make the three propagators high temperature, we take this topology and make the three propagators high temperature. That, that corresponds to a slightly different index contraction of the uh, H heavy, heavy, heavy OPE coefficients. Uh, and now we repeat the same computation. Now again, there is the two wick contractions that correspond to these two standard wormholes of the standard wormhole and the disconnected solution. But then interestingly, there's also uh, a fourth order vertex that you can compute independently from the genus three partition function that you can study. Uh, and this is also here, and you can estimate this, and it turns out that this one is much larger than this one here. And that suggests that there should be yet another wormhole whose gravitational uh, action is larger than this one here, than the Maldus and the Maus one. That's an interesting prediction. We have not been able to verify it. You can compute the action for that unknown new wormhole. Uh, and it turns out that this action is kind of interesting because it depends on a rather complicated way on the central charge of the theory. But it also depends non-trivially on the dimension of the lightest non-trivial scalar field in the theory. Um, that strongly suggests that this wormhole um, should be supported by some matter field, and in particular that it's supported by the lightest scalar in the theory. Otherwise, the partition function would not depend on the dimension of the lighter scalar. If it was a purely gravitational solution, uh, this delta of chi would not appear in the uh, partition function. So the proposal is that here there is a new wormhole. It's supported by the lighter scalar in the theory, but we have not been able to find it yet. Uh, sorry, Jan, how do you, how, what is the difference between the, the last line and the second line? How, how do you get that wormhole? 
the last uh, the last one the third line here yeah 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 so so here there is a fourth order vertex so if you go back to this uh, generating functional here this thing has quadratic vertices on the first line and then there's like a fourth order vertex on the second line right okay we can compute this fourth order vertex that gives rise to a connected four point correlator of four C's by computing a genus three Riemann surface. Uh, because if you draw a genus three Riemann surface, I see, I see, okay. It has four OPE coefficients in it and it gives precisely rise to such fourth order vertices. So that's input, that's independent input that we get from just the standard genus three computation. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And if we use that, input from this genus three computations was all a bit indirect and we plug it into this particular computation then out comes this prediction for a new normal that's supported by metaphors with this particular uh, action with this partition function uh, a simpler case is if you simply take uh, the thermal two-point function and you take two copies of the thermal two-point function this is literally the thing that that you can uh, ETH. Uh, if you take the product of two two point functions at finite temperature, this again, this non trivial wick contraction, which is drawn here, which again suggests that there should be formal solutions that, uh, that, that look like this thing here, which with two finite temperature boundaries and four light fields supporting it. Uh, and this is something that uh, one can check. So uh, this is work in progress, but it appears that these wormholes exist at least as uh, complexified solutions. Um, and it may well be that these complexified solutions also have the right magnitude to explain uh, this connected correlator. And this would be a very nice check of this general formalism. But um, can I ask another question? So you have infinitely many terms in that expansion. So you will have in principle higher genus corrections as well. Yeah, um, and um, is there is there any argument why they would be suppressed compared to the the three wormhole solutions that you you just showed us? Yeah. Or uh... um, well, for this computation, for this particular computation here, for example, there's at most four C, there's four C, so you need just fourth order vertices. Uh, yeah, I was referring to the to the or to the other one. Um, oh, this one here, you mean? Yeah, yeah. So there, for example, I mean, you can you can have a j to the sixth term in the expansion, and that would give rise to like a genus four. Um, yeah, that's that is that is there. But we are here. We are computing something that only involves four Cs. So um, this j to the sixth term would never contribute here because it would okay. be okay. 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 I see. You could have for, for, right. it not include the four point vertices in this computation. Um, and I should have, but in this case, you can check that they are actually uh, subleading. So they uh, they don't have a subleading corresponding to this wormhole. So there's no reason to believe that uh, they give rise to a new wormhole. They could just give rise to a numerical small correction to this wormhole. Okay, thanks. Uh, but that's so that's the qualitative difference between this case and uh, and this case, where the fourth order vertex does give a leading contribution. Yeah, and higher order vertices principle are all there uh, you could compute them from higher genus computations but as far uh, they are not relevant for this computation that's correct thanks um since it's five o'clock let me just briefly say that i have been focusing mostly on operator statistics you can also um think about spectral statistics this has been studied extensively and uh, it's interesting to think about uh, the implications of spectral statistics. The philosophy is exactly the same. One thing that is maybe a bit uh, less obvious is to what extent spectral statistics, especially in this uh, sort of famous RAM plateau region, um, is really part of the semi-classical theory because it involves very, very late time physics, exponentially late times. Uh, and as soon as you introduce an exponential time scale in the problem, uh, you need to wonder whether uh, low energy effective field theory or semi-classical gravity is still reliable or not. Uh, I'm inclined to think it's it's not supposed to be reliable, 
if you compute a two-point function and the separation in times is exponentially large. Um, now, okay, so it's interesting to think about uh, these uh, statistical correlations too. And then the final question that you can ask is, very well, so we have this formalism. We tried, basically what we tried to do is we tried to parameterize all our low energy information in the most agnostic way possible. So we try to just take all our low energy information that we have, and we try to ask the question, what is the structure that you can write down, which uses no additional ingredients, it only uses low energy information, and what is then the structure that comes out? And that's, that's very much a question in the spirit of statistical physics. Um, because in statistical physics, for example, the standard Boltzmann distribution comes about by demanding two things. Um, the Boltzmann distribution is obtained by requiring only two things. You require that the state has maximal entropy, so maximal ignorance, if you wish, and it is the right expectation value of the energy. And if you just impose those two criteria, you get the standard thermal state out, E minus beta H divided by Z beta. Now here, what we seem to be uh, having is something more general because we seem to see that the high energy theory appears as a random theory. Uh, in particular, we don't know the precise spectrum of the theory, which means we don't know the precise Hamiltonian of the theory. It's not computable at, in the low energy theory. So there is some uncertainty in even what the Hamiltonian of the theory is. Uh, there's also other reasons um, to believe. There's other types of uncertainties. And um, one proposal that you could have is that the type of statistical framework that captures all the features that we're seeing here is to replace the standard notion of a density matrix from a quantum statistical mechanics by a measure on the space of density matrices. This is in particular something that you get for free if you do an average over theories. Because if you have some coupling constant uh, and you average over Hj divided by Z beta and so on, if you put some delta functions there that average thermal states over Hamiltonians that depend on some coupling constant, you get a probability distribution on, on the space of density matrices. So maybe, maybe what we should do if we want to mimic what we did or what Boltzmann did a century ago for statistical physics or so, if you want to mimic that to describe semi-classical gravity in the spirit of statistical physics, we should try to write down uh, some measure on the space of density matrices rather than a single state. And then you can ask, what are the things that replace those two basic assumptions of statistical mechanics, namely that there is maximal entropy and that you have the right value of the energy? Well, the, the minimal thing you can do is to uh, keep the same two criteria. You just need to think hard what you mean by maximal entropy if you have a measure on the space of density matrices, but that you can write down using a combination of classical and quantum entropy. And you could still insist that the expectation value of the energy is input. Uh, and if you do that, you get, for example, uh, a measure on the space of density matrices. It's a very straightforward computation, which is given by e to the minus the relative entropy of the state in of rho with the thermal state. So it's some probability distribution that is peaked around the thermal state, but it has a certain width. Uh, and that seems to be controlled by the relative entropy. And it turns out that this particular super simple generalization of, of basic quantum statistical mechanics to uh, probability distributions on space of density matrix has some really nice features and uh, some work. In it also has, it's a bit complicated, but it has some really nice features that seem to agree with things that we see in, uh, for example, ETH. Uh, so the hope is that with this new or a generalization thereof, we can maybe even derive ETH in the spirit of statistical mechanics. And that would be really cool. Um, and I'm out of time, let me conclude. 
So uh, I hoped to try to explain to you that semi-classical gravity is the theory of the statistics of the high energy chaotic sector of the theory. And that this picture is consistent with all known wormhole solutions that we know, and it also uh, predicts a few new wormhole solutions that we're trying to find. It is also completely consistent, for example, with some observations in the recent paper by uh, Schlenker and Witten that uh, wormholes only correct low energy observers non perturbatively. I told you that it's a great question about whether there is a single, simple, overarching statistical framework that generalizes statistical mechanics. Uh, and includes all the physics that we see in gravity. Um, I think very many uh, of the techniques that we're using are very similar to what one does in the bootstrap, because uh, very often people that uh, do bootstrap, what they find is so-called sum rules, and sum rules are again coarse-grained quantities that involve sums over high energy physics. Uh, so all the sum rules that you get from bootstrap approaches, in some sense, are very similar in spirit to what I have been describing. They are sum rules and they give statistical high energy information. It's still an open question whether wormholes actually have genuine new information or whether all the information in wormholes is already encoded by just doing single sided computations. It's an open problem whether we can actually prove whatever that means, the chaotic random matrix nature of the high energy sector of these strongly coupled CFTs. I also think it's interesting to think whether there's any other interesting deep lessons or not for other chaotic systems in nature. Uh, maybe there's a much more universal story to be told here. Um, if what is being said here is all correct, then I think it will be, uh, the one conclusion will be that it is incredibly difficult to probe proper interesting aspects of quantum gravity using only semi-classical gravity. It's like semi-classical gravity is doing the best possible job that it can to hide anything quantum from observation, which would be a bit disappointing from an experimental point of view. Um, and the last thing I uh, wanted to point out that according to this picture, semi-classical gravity is averaging agnostic. The high energy theory could be averaged, it could not be averaged, but whether or not it is, is irrelevant because the semi-classical gravity cannot see the difference between the two. The only thing you can say is that as you do more and more precise computations in the semi-classical theory, you sort of squeeze the amount of averaging that uh, you might be agnostic to, but you can never squeeze it down to zero. So semi-classical gravity is really an averaging agnostic theory. And that is uh, my answer to the question whether gravity is averaged or not. It's neither, it's agnostic. Uh, I'd like to stop here. Thank you. Sorry for going over time. Yeah, thank you very much, Jan. That was a very, very um, interesting talk. And um, we had a lot of questions already, but um, are there more? There's one in the chat, I think. Yes, there's one in the chat. So maybe we should take that one first by Igor. Um, is Igor still around? Uh, let me check. I, I can just read them. Uh, yeah, Igor seems to be around, but let me read the... Um, Question coupling gravity with matter fields. Should one expect new saddle points contributing to connected wormhole partition functions for operators below critical dimension C over 12? Um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, these, um, the two examples that I gave, uh, this one here requires, um, um, th this one requires, let's see, well, if delta chi is C over 12, I, uh, this let's see c over 12 30 then then this like this one requires actually a field that is lighter than c over 12. in fact it requires a field that's lighter than c over 10 or so i forget or uh, 25 over 25 c over 360 to be precise um otherwise this thing will be subdominant so this is an example of a prediction for the wormhole that is supposed to be supported by a matter field whose dimension is much less than C over 12. Now, it does not say that there must be matter fields with dimension less than C over 12. So if this lighter scalar field is simply absent from the theory, then this wormhole um, will, 
let me be a bit more precise. So if if I go here, there's two possible contractions here. Um, if delta chi is light, then the third line dominates over the second line. If delta chi becomes too heavy, then the third line no longer dominates over the second line. And then the third line might as well be interpreted as giving a subleading correction to the wormhole in the second line. If, however, the third line is dominant, then it cannot be interpreted as a subleading correction to the wormhole in the second line, and there must be an independent wormhole that describes it. Um, so whether or not this independent wormhole is there depends on the lighter scalar in the theory, but uh, this story does not say anything about uh, possible dimensions of those lighter scalars. The only observation is that if the lighter scalar has a dimension that is low enough, then this new wormhole should exist and is presumably supported by that matter field because of the form of the partition function. Uh, and similarly, this other one here, uh, this is fairly generically should exist for almost any matter field, uh, including light ones below C over 12. So these four light operators on the boundary are supposed to support this wormhole. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Igor. Please feel free to follow up. Um, if that is not the case, then okay, Igor writes. Thank you. Um, then let's take another question. And I know we're already a little bit over over the normal time. But maybe someone who has another urgent question. Um, well, if nobody is asking a question, since um, yeah, go ahead, Uwe. Yeah, I, I was wondering if you want to resolve um, this averaging. So if, if you consider higher point functions instead of just two, two point functions, three point functions, suppose that you consider like um, e to n square point functions. Imagine that you can do these computations in a CFT. Would you be able to see the uh, quantum gravitational nature? Um, I would think so. Uh... Yeah, I would think that that's in the question is whether that uh, can be done with any um, precision in the semi classical theory. That I don't think is possible. Yeah. Because you have so many operators that you're probably running completely outside the realm of validity of the low energy theory. Uh, but if you could do that, you might even be able to already see some things if you have n operators in the theory. Uh, but certainly e to the n squared would definitely do the job. Okay. There is this uh, standard little argument that, for example, um, if you want to, uh, if you have like a mixed density matrix, suppose that this is a cartoon for the final state of Hawking radiation, right? So mixed state, and it has e to the s entries and they're all e to the minus s. <laughs> if you want to purify this, the simplest thing that you can do is to, to make e minus s appear everywhere. And now this is suddenly describing a pure state. So if you have, so you can go from a mixed state to a pure state with exponentially small corrections, but you need an exponentially large number of exponentially small corrections. Uh, and, and by sort of that type of thinking, you can sort of argue that, so this is the sort of thing that uh, you could detect presumably with very high point correlators of low energy observables. This, these types of phenomena. And clearly this is a, a, this would really be a quantum gravitational observation because now you would see that the final state is pure and not mixed as in the page curve. So yes. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Um, to, to, to. Yeah, so... Um, in how much do you expect typicality constraints wormhole partition functions? Um, mm, 
Yeah, I don't have, I think not so much. Because it's the fact that typicality um, is, the fact that typical states seem to be indistinguishable from non from like ensemble averages as far as low energy physics go, I think goes through for wormholes. Um, and I don't, unless we find an independent uh, approach that allows us to study typical states that are not ensemble averages independently, and people have suggested doing those types of things, so for example, end of the world brains, uh, that unless we reuse those types of ingredients, I'm not sure it will constrain wormhole partition functions very much. Feel free to follow up if that's if there's anything you would like to clarify. But you could ask whether we have really proven in a graph. You can ask a simpler question, maybe like, uh, uh, do we really know in a gravitational theory that a typical state is indistinguishable from a black hole? Um, and I'm not sure, honestly, how, uh, how many independent arguments we have for that, because I think a lot of the reasoning is circular, which is like, well, in a typical state, you know, it's statistical physics, so uh, things, all expectation values look exactly the same, like the thermal ones, blah, blah, blah. But that's logic, and then you're using circular logic. So I think the best argument that we have that typical states will look like a black hole is that generic initial states that collapse as far as we know by the no hair theorem will start to look like a black hole once everything falls to a trapped horizon to a trapped surface i think that's the strongest independent argument is the fact that uh, you have this trapped surface and once everything goes to the trapped surface there is no endpoint uh, there's the only thing you can have is the black hole and then there's the black hole no hair theorem so those are sort of the strongest gravitational counterparts of the statement that typical states are indistinguishable from the ensemble average, I think. I'm not sure this. Yeah. Thank you very much for the for the answers, Jan. Um, thanks to everyone for the questions. So let's call it um, a seminar for today and switch off the recording. Thank you again, Jan, for this very nice presentation. Thanks everyone for for participating in the lively discussions and see you all next week.